I'm in beautiful Portland, Maine. This place is absolutely amazing. I'm here with Matt McCroy, the author. This guy is an amazing researcher. He's done a phenomenal job learning a lot of ancient texts and spending thousands of hours studying and researching and putting the pieces of the puzzle together to help mankind understand where we really came from. We have an amazing lighthouse back here. Now, tomorrow, we're gonna film an episode on Forbidden Lost TV where we're gonna actually get on a ferry and take a trip all the way out to that island you see out there. We're gonna go out to that island and we're gonna walk around. We're going to uh, find a great spot to sit down and have another amazing power with this gonna be recorded for Forbidden Lost TV where we're gonna drop some serious knowledge. Then we're gonna grab lunch on the island and then we're gonna take a ferry back. So tomorrow's gonna be a fantastic day out here in Portland, Maine. Billy Carson and Matt McCroy. Hey, what's up guys? Billy Carson here, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I'm here with Matt LaCroix, the famous author, The Stage of Time, and also The Illusion of Us. You need to get both of those books, and of course my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. We are out here now in a very remote island in the North Atlantic. Uh, we walked a few miles to get here. It's an amazing place. The views and scenery is absolutely incredible. We are like one with nature right now, okay? The perfect place for us to have our mastermind discussion. And so I'm really pumped. I'm really excited about this talk. But today we're going to talk about the myth of Adapa. And it's a Sumerian cuneiform tablet that's hardly ever been read or talked about. And today we're going to go over it and we're actually going to read some of it to you and we're going to expound on it and have a discussion, a mastermind discussion about this today, okay? Absolutely. I guess the real question is, Billy, you know, who are we? Yeah. You know, are we just this animal that's fighting for the, you know, survival of the fittest here? Yeah. Or are we truly like gods? Exactly, exactly. And I'm starting to think now, based on the research, probably the latter. I would think so too. So let's go ahead and um, I'll, I'll start us out, Billy. Yeah. The myth of Adapa, as Billy said, is a cuneiform tablet uncovered in the Iraqi region of what's today um, in, the, in the Mesopotamian area. And it is an important tablet because what it provides us is the evidence for who we really were when we were first created as perfection. Right. And then, of course, we've fallen to the state we're in now, mm -hmm. but we can't forget where we came from and who we really are. Exactly. So we're gonna read some evidence that truly tells us who we are, and then we're gonna expand on it and get into timelines, the nature of reality. Oh, yeah. This is gonna be a, a nice discussion here on the, the, the shores of this remote beach here mm -hmm. on, on a secret island that we've taken a ferry to get out to. That's right. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna start here from the myth of Adapa. He, Adapa, possessed intelligence. His command, like the command of Anu. He, the god Ea, granted him a wide ear to reveal the destiny of the land. He granted him wisdom, but he did not grant him eternal life. In those days, in those years, the wise man of Eridu, Ea, had created him as chief among men. A wise man whose command none shall oppose. The prudent, the most wise among. The most wise among the Anunnaki was he. The most wise among the Anunnaki was he. This is incredible stuff, guys. If you really understand what I'm talking about, we're saying that we ourselves are the Anunnaki and we ourselves are the gods. Okay? It's been hidden from us. Blameless of clean hands, anointed, observer of the divine statues. So, I mean, that is phenomenal, Billy. Here we are, people are in, in what it's often a very difficult life where they're struggling yeah. just to get enough money to feed mm -hmm. their families. And we're in this place where, you know, wars break out all over the earth. We're in this very violent state. Yeah. And at the same time, we've been deceived to not understand that we are like these divine creator gods. Exactly. And we're not supposed to be in that state. Mm -hmm. Billy, what do you think that this would do if this kind of information became well known in society? Well, the ruling elite that are really running this planet, which is only about less than really 1% of the population. It's really only 100 families that are controlling everything. And at the top of that small family pyramid, it's probably no more than 10 people that are making all the final decisions over everything. They're thinking, they're, they're making decisions on everything we eat, smell, drink, touch, hear, and travel, everything we do. And for them to keep the lock and control over the masses, now there's 7.7 .7 billion people on Earth. In order to control that many people, 
you have to be able to deceive, you have to be able to suppress, you have to be able to oppress, and to do that, you have to make up a lot of crazy rules that may be crazy for us, but for them makes a lot of logical sense. And if we were to find out the secrets to the way that they've set up this system, and we were to break through this matrix, we literally would collapse their system and rob them of their power, and we would regain our full power back, and they don't want that to happen. If that happens, think about this just for once. The, the, the religious industry just in America alone is worth more than all of the uh, tech companies in Silicon Valley's in one year. Religion alone is a multi-trillion dollar industry, and globally, it's a multi-Google industry. Google is an actual number. It's not just a search engine. So this is the type of money we're talking about, and with money comes power. So by learning the true divine nature of ourselves, understanding that the spark that created the entire universe is actually inside of our bodies, and knowing that we are the gods and the power is inside of us, would steal that energy back from them, give it back to ourselves, and depose them. Yeah, exactly. Well said, Billy. And I want to point out that in 1945, a very important ancient text was found um, in Egypt along the Nile River. And that text was known as the Nag Hammadi Scriptures. Mm -hmm. And it's an ancient set of Gnostic texts, which is basically knowledge that was from Egypt earlier on. And the, the reason I bring that up is one of the chapters in there is called the Secret Book of John. And in that chapter, it talks all about how this figure, Adapa, this figure of what became mankind, humanity, was created not only to be uh, superior to anything else that was on this planet in terms of an animal, but it became even superior, as we mentioned, to the Anunnaki themselves. Mm -hmm. So in the secret book of John, this figure called Yaldabaoth, who we know was in the Sumerian equivalent of Enlil, Enlil. it talks about how Yaldabaoth became extremely jealous over this perfection of this sentient being known as Adapa. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he vowed to keep that being in a, in a constant state of chaos yes. in order to not, to not allow it to become the true potential of what it can. So Billy and I, I feel like when we're trying to bring this ancient knowledge in, it's not that we're just trying to have people understand what happened in the past. We're trying to bring back that perfection and bring it back into the society and exactly. humanity as a whole. Exactly. That's exactly what we have to do. Because I think that we need to find a way to re-empower the people. And, 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 and what's happened is we, a lot of us uh, around the planet have given away our power to wait for a savior to come and save us. Not realizing that the true power of saving is inside of each one of us. And they, we, we are literally sent here to save ourselves. It's part of this master universal lesson to becoming uh, an ascended master, an adept initiate, whatever you want to call it, to get to the next level consciously. Some call it 5D consciousness. But when you truly understand that the voice you hear inside your head is your own, and that the ability to save yourself and others comes from inside of you, that's when it's going to really click for humanity and take us to the next level. Exactly. So this Adapa figure that we mentioned was not actually a king, but he was considered what's known as a sage. In a lot of these ancient tablets, they mention how the sages emerged out of society from these individuals that were extremely intelligent, mm -hmm. that could almost become guides to the rest of humanity. Yeah. So Adapa, in the text I mentioned, there's one line that I think is really interesting. It said that he, the god Ea, who we know is Enki, the mm -hmm. creator of mankind, granted him a wide ear to reveal the destiny of the land. Mm. Now, Billy, as we get going talking about destiny yeah. and about showing how they essentially decide how entire regions and mm -hmm. cultures of people <laughs> yeah. are going to go, we're going to be getting into several other tablets. That's right, we're not even just doing the myth of Adapa. We're going to do two other tablets and we're going to break them down mm -hmm. and expand on understanding who we really are what we're part of in this nature of reality and how timelines go. Right. Time is not something that can always be measured on a linear way, right Billy? That's right. We as humans have taken this arrow of time in a way to sort of keep us uh, in, a, in a type of alignment and understanding so that we can make appointments and so forth and so on and we can understand uh, a differentiation between the past, present and future. However, there are beings that are that look or we look just like them and they, they look just like us that have become the masters of time and they have learned to see the past present and future all at once and this is talked about in these tablets and it's made its way into a lot of sci-fi films 
Um, but and nobody really had paid attention because it just seems like great entertainment. But I'll tell you what it really is. It's enlightenment through entertainment. If you've read these ancient tablets like we have and studied them. Exactly, Billy. And so we're going to just we're going to move into the next tablet and we're going to expand on what we're talking about right now. Now, the next tablet we're going to break down, I don't believe has ever been written or uh, spoken about in a discussion that I've ever seen before. Yeah. So we're bringing back knowledge from thousands and thousands of years ago and we're using our voice to project it and right. bring it into this time. Exactly. So this tablet is it's called the Enlil and Sud tablet. And I guarantee that most people have never heard of it. Now this was recovered in 1849 in the Ashurbanipal Library as part of this great catch that was found in the area known as Nineveh, Iraq. Mm -hmm. When Austin Henry Layard found this in 1849, there was 30,000 cuneiform tablets un uncovered and today only a couple hundred of those tablets have ever been translated. Yeah. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. Billy, why don't you set us up? Go ahead and tell us the setting up, up here and then we'll get right into the text. The setting, the city of Nippur in the Ikur the mountain shrine of the gods, referred to as the Temple of Enlil, Iraq, pre-Diluvian city. This is before the flood. Exactly. So go ahead and get us started. Okay. At that time, Enlil had not yet been given a wife in the Ikur. Ninlil's name was not yet famous in the Kiur. After traveling through Sumer and to the ends of the universe, searching throughout the land, he, Enlil, the great mountain, stopped at Erek, Nippur. As he looked around, he found the woman of his choice. He appreciated her, overflowing with joy, engaged her in conversation. Enlil states, I will make you perfect in a queen's dress. How impressed I am by your beauty, even if I, even if I am a shameless person. In her youthful experience, Sood answered Enlil, If I want to stand proudly at our gate, who dares to give me a bad reputation? What are your intentions? Why have you come here? Others have already tried to deceive and made me angry. Enlil answered Sood, standing closer to her. Come, I want to speak to you. I will have a talk with you about your daughter becoming my wife. Hmm, incredible. I am Enlil, the descendant and offspring of Ankar, the noble, the lord of heaven and earth. The name of your daughter shall become Ninlil, and all the foreign countries shall know it. She shall sit with me in the Ikur. She shall determine the fates. She shall apportion the divine powers among the Anuna, the great gods. As for you, I will place in your hands the lives of the black-headed people. And it goes on to end by saying, tell Enlil the great mountain, do as you wish. Let his sister come from her side and she'll accompany Sud from here. Women, the proudest among the great princesses, from now on, Sud will become Ninlil. As the presents are given in the shrine of Nibru, a holy song of praise is sung. Enlil, the lord of the countries. Mm, incredible. Wow. So, Billy, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there for us to break down and talk about. I'll go yeah. ahead and get us started and then yeah. we can expand on it. Think about the word Ninlil for a minute. Mm -hmm. So these names don't break down. Like for instance, if someone is born today and, and, a, and a parent say, well, I like this name because it sounds nice. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pick it for them. Back then, that's not how it worked. No. Names were, were derived from a specific title mm -hmm. and a sp specific way to represent to yourself. Right. And so in this case, Enlil, is the term is representing the masculine form, whereas Ninlil mm -hmm. is, becomes his consort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about that is she's a human. Yeah. She's not one of the Anunnaki. That's right. She's one of the humans who becomes like a god just like them. Now, what's really interesting, Billy, and we're going to expand on this and yeah. talk about it more, but right here, she, it mentions that once she becomes his consort, mm -hmm. she can what? Determine the fates. <laughs> now, what do, what do you think that means? You know, this is really interesting because what we're going to, we're going to get into it deeper, but it seems as if these Anunnaki, they're talking about these fates and determining fates and determining destinies a lot in these tablets. And it seems as if they had access to some type of technology that gave them an idea, or at least, or of some type of future timelines that could coexist in superposition of each other. In other words, a, a multiversal timeline. In other words, they could see things happening moving forward with specific individuals and specific groups of people and they can decide whether or not they wanted those things to come to fruition the natural way or could they influence them 
in the way that they saw fit to get the outcome that they wanted. And in other words, how could they create ripples in the space-time continuum that would alter future realities in this third dimension to benefit them? Exactly. And I think one of the other takeaways from this is if we look at the story of where we came from and these bloodlines fighting around the world, one of the interesting the aspects to look at is when we look into the, the Book of Enoch, found along the Dead Sea in the 1945 time period, we see that this term that's, that's spoken about with these Anunnaki is that when you compare um, the Book of Enoch to um, something like uh, Atrahasis or Numa Elish, it mentions that there are 300 of these Anunnaki gods total yeah. that rule heaven, but 200 of them decided to come down and descend into mm -hmm. our reality yeah. and intermingle with humans. Mm -hmm. And it states that those fallen angels first came down on top of Mount Hermon, Mount which Hermon. is in Lebanon. Yep. The interesting thing about that, for those who study Lebanon in the country, is that in Baalbek, Lebanon, we find the largest megalithic stones in the entire world, meaning yeah. that the sophistication and technology was at its height there. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I bring that up is that you see that Enlil travels all over the universe, and yet he finds this perfect, most beautiful woman <laughs> on Earth here, on Earth. and her name ends up becoming uh, Ninlil, Ninlil, but she's originally known as Sud. That means that these Anunnaki are actively seeking these certain royal bloodline princesses to become yeah. their consorts. And Absolutely. it tells you that they are, they've been constantly intermingling with human affairs all along. All along. So all Billy, along. I'm going to go ahead and I want you to read um, a section called, from another tablet called En Merkar in the Lord of Arata. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to read the first part so we can get uh, an idea of this and just go all the way um, Right there. Okay. You can read mine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In those days of yore, when the destinies were determined, the great princess Ayana, also known as Ishtar, allowed Ureg. Is that the. Eridu. Er oh, Eridu. Yes. Sorry. Unug allowed, or Eridu. Yeah. yeah. yeah er, Erug or Eridu, which is the uh, same thing, to lift their head in high power and power over the region. Yeah. And then it goes on to state that. Before the land of Dil Moon yet existed, the Yanas of Anug were well founded. Now, what does that mean? Well, we know from Enki and the World Order tablet that the land of Dil Moon was the area of Saudi Arabia today. Mm -hmm. So it tells you that these areas were connected. Mm -hmm. But what's important about that, Billy, and I want to just, the reason I had you read about yeah. it, is it says, when the destinies were determined again, mm -hmm. Not that things are random, right. but that things get decided. Right. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to connect with another tablet to expand on what that means. Right. Yeah, these uh, Anunnaki were very specific in how they were determining the future outcome of realities on this planet. And they really uh, stated it so many times. So we have to now believe that they did have this power. Exactly. Um, and one of the things that um, I will, I'll also bring up is that, and we'll get into talking about it more, but in En Makar and the Lord of Arata, one of the things it says, it mentions is Ianas. This, t this term E apostrophe A-N-A-S, Inanas. And in another part of the text, it mentions, it says, May the lands of Sumer, the great mountain of the Mi, of magnificence. Now, these Mi's or mm. Ianas, yeah. or what I believe in, are these types of crystals yes. used to determine timelines. Yeah. And now let's ex let's hold there for a minute, Billy, mm -hmm. and let's read another section of this tablet and then we'll connect the whole thing. Okay. So the last tablet we have that we're going to read today is called The Legend of Atana. Now The Legend of Atana is easily one of the most important and one of my favorite tablets of all time. Because what Atana is, is he the, he, he's the first king of the post-Diluvian world. After the deluges go through and destroy everything, he ends up becoming their king. Yeah. So let me go ahead and grab that. No problem. This is a post-Diluvial Anunnaki king. Um, it's really an amazing story. I mean, this, this stuff, guys, you're not gonna hear a lot of this stuff anywhere else. And so, so just to give a little background on this, when the deluge came, came through, and we have a lot of evidence across the world that these cataclysms occurred, yeah. wiping out these ancient civilizations. I mentioned Baalbek in Lebanon. When you go and you look at um, these massive stones that are famous, the most famous of all is called the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. Yeah. And it's a massive stone that sticks out of the ground that's still part of the quarry. Mm -hmm. Just like when we go to Aswan, Egypt, yeah. and we look at the unfinished obelisk there. Right. Now, what that tells us is that there were cataclysms that disrupted them finishing those structures. That's right. And they remained in the quarries. Yeah. And the point of that is, 
that what Atana says in this tablet that we're about to read is that he's the first king that's allowed to rule after everything is destroyed mm -hmm. and it's the new world. Yeah. And this is where I believe the knowledge of the past and the control that became today really started to take hold. Yeah. Because they, what they were essentially doing was having to create civilization all over again. Yep. And so Billy, why don't you go ahead and get us started? They planned a city. The gods laid its foundations. They planned the city of Kish. The Ijiji founded its brickwork. Let him be their people's shepherd. Let Atana be their architect. The great Anunnaki gods, ordainers of destinies, sat taking its, their counsel concerning the land. The creators of the four, four world regions, establishers of all physical form. Mm. Wow. So what Billy, what I find fascinating about that, and I want to get your thoughts, is that not only do we find out that Kish is the first city created after the deluge, mm -hmm. And that Anana is chosen to be their architect. Yeah. It's not that Anana just happens to be a king who, let's say, rises up with people around him and he becomes their king. He's a specific bloodline king that's chosen, chosen. to rule as an architect. Right. Now there's that term, Billy, that is so important that, we're, that really is feeding into this conversation. Mm -hmm. And that is this term right here. The great Anunnaki gods, ordainers of destinies. Now, didn't we just hear about that in every single one of our tablets we read? Yeah. That they either decree the fates mm -hmm. of man, yes. or they're the ordainers of destinies, which is the same thing, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. Now, what, why would these gods, these powerful beings, why would they want to influence it and have a part in our timeline and our reality? Well, if you're looking for a break, to create a breakaway civilization on a planet like Earth, which has a wealth of life and resources here, and requires a significant amount of labor, I mean a significant amount of labor, to create the civilization that you're accustomed to living to in a high, in a high tech or a, a, a very high level of civilization, uh, you're going to need to be able to uh, control people. You're going to need to be, to be able to mass produce people or get them to mass produce themselves, uh, which is what part of a lot of the, um, the cloning initially and then going into this um, artificial insemination that they use by adding their DNA and and uh, inserting it into the womb and this whole process that they talk about in multiple different tablets to create what we now call the homo sapien sapien which is really a version of them uh, but now because there were so many of us and needing to be able to control these masses you have now kings and pharaohs and so forth that are the liaison between the gods and the people uh, you know so you and you net you know which ones you want to rise to power which ones you want to sink and if you're an opponent of one of these uh, Anunnaki's that came from another planet, you may want to sink one of their rising stars and put yours in its place because you want to have control over the people of that area. All these internal battles and wars were going on and being fought right above humans' head without us even knowing about it. Exactly. And this isn't just with um, kings like Atana. It's, you see this story. These, this term of being an or, these Anunnaki being the ordainers of destinies, and then this aspect that there's a certain kind of bloodline king that needs to rule is carried all throughout history. And it's not just in cuneiform tablets, Billy. If we go to the land of Persia, which is today Iran, mm -hmm. um, the ancient king known as Darius I, there's an inscription known as the Behistun inscription that's found 300 feet up on a sheer ledge. Wow. And that inscription tells us that Darius essentially says that he was chosen by Ahura Mazda mm. to be a ruler of the people. Yeah. It wasn't that he was in favor of, of Ahura Mazda. Mm -hmm. Ahura Mazda specifically chose him. Right. And so what we find is Ahura Mazda, that's just the Persian version of Enki. That's it. And so we see this, this battle going back and forth where either Enlil or Enki or a lot of their second generation gods mm -hmm. would be popping up um, these certain bloodline kings to rule in their name, to yeah. rule in their uh, rules and how they want those civilizations to be run. Right. And I just want to bring up a couple others that people uh, might be curious about. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, we see the same thing. Mm -hmm. Gilgamesh is told that he's a great hero because they look at his possible timelines and what he could become right. and he has greatness in his future. Yeah. And that's why Gilgamesh becomes a great king and he just so, so happens to be one of these great giant bloodline kings of the Anunnaki. That's right. And what it tells me is that it's not necessarily just about them being cer certain bloodlines, but they may have certain gifts that became 
um, a lot more dwindled later on in society. Mm -hmm. These enlightened gifts of intellect yeah. and having gifts that connect back to the pure version of Adapa, like we first mentioned. Mm -hmm. Another one I want to bring up is an incredible um, figure out of, out of Babylon known as Hammurabi. And in the Code of Hammurabi, he's, he basically states that he's, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, Anu in Bel, call by name me, Hammurabi, the exalted prince who feared God mm. to bring about righteousness to the land. And he goes on to talk about how he wants to rule over the evildoers and create the civilization, just like Atana says. Yeah, right. The architect of the shep be the shepherd of the people. Mm -hmm. And I think um, what's interesting about that is that it's not that how our history has gone has been completely random. It's been controlled by these certain powerful individuals yeah. that create these great empires and armies. Yep. And today, we don't think that that's around anymore. But Billy, isn't there still this obsession over certain powerful families and bloodlines that have control over us? Oh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you have the banking elite that literally have installed a central banking system on virtually every continent on this planet and just about almost every country uh, on this planet. And we have uh, people at that high level that are making a lot of the decisions. When you look at um, uh, the different institutions that rise up uh, to make decisions above the United States government even, and to keep this certain level of control and power and domination over mankind, even they go to the, to the great lengths of suppressing technologies that could free us, that could take third world countries and turn them into very prosperous countries uh, and they can, uh, they have a lot of, uh, you know, cures that have been suppressed and they now have pharmaceuticals that literally keep us sick, you know, so there's a lot going on that they've done to keep us uh, weak and a little bit less intelligent just so that we don't realize our true power and try to rise up above them. That's right, Billy. Well said. It seems like the entire system that's been created here, and I'd like to point out that the second chapter in the book that we're working on, Billy Carson is gonna break down that entire system yeah. and really show that we have the potential to ascend to a level that's far greater than, than most of us really understand here. Mm -hmm. We really are those creator gods yep. that are trapped in this lower vibrational frequency that we really don't belong in. Exactly. You know, when you look at energy and what makes us the highest potential we can be, we have instilled within us these chakra centers of energy that perfectly mimic the visible light spectrum. Yes. The problem is though, Billy, if someone is kept in their red, their lowest root chakra, mm -hmm. the lowest form of energy they can be in, yeah. they will never be able to obtain a higher state of energy. And, and how could you be ruled by your lowest state of energy in that red root chakra? Fear, mm -hmm. war, having division, hatred towards others. Yes. You're never gonna be able to move out of that lower state of energy mm -hmm. and become that light being that we're supposed to be all along. Exactly. They want to keep that away from us to understand that we are really truly beings of light. Our avatar bodies are even made of light because every single atom is, is a part of a wave particle duality in quantum physics. So we exist as a light wave before we collapse through consciousness ourselves into this physical avatar body, which is really an illusion. As a matter of fact, there's 7.7 .7 billion people on Earth. And because atoms are 99.99% .99 empty space, if I was to take the empty space out of every single human avatar body and just collapse it, I can fit every person, all 7.7 .7 billion people into a circuit cube. So they understand that we are literally light beings. We are inhabiting light bodies. And once we come to the true knowledge of what we really truly are and how we can really command things into existence, how we can command and create and empower our own destinies, which I like to call creating or managing our own reality tunnels, then they would be opposed and uh, they would have nowhere to go. They'd have to flee because we outnumber them. Exactly, and I think the greatest power we have is the power of imagination and to create. We have the ability to take any idea and manifest it mm -hmm. into something that is truly real in the third dimension. And I want to bring out the example, um, you know, Billy came all the way up here to visit me and have these awesome discussions. And while we were here, we were able to sit down and it wasn't just these hypothetical ideas yeah. of creating chapters, but we laid out what we're going to be writing in the, in the new book. Mm -hmm. And Billy, do you want to share what the title of our new book is? Oh, wow. <laughs> the Epic of Humanity. This is going to be an epic book. Okay. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's going to be such a phenomenal story. 
I'm so excited about, I haven't been, I've, I've been excited, but this is something I've been like truly, like the last three or four days for me have been bliss because I'm, I'm focused on this thing like you wouldn't believe, Matt. I mean, I'm digging in, I'm coming up with all kinds of ideas. I'm thinking about what tablets, what texts, what scriptures, what papyruses. I'm going into everything I can and what type of modern science that I can bring into this to verify and validate the concepts uh, behind the parts that I'm writing. I'm really looking forward to co-writing this book with you. Thank you. It's truly an honor to do, do this work with you, Billy. Yeah. I have enormous respect for everything you've done. And I think this collaboration of taking all of these different tablets and ancient texts and then bringing them together and combining them with our understanding of things like superstring theory and quantum yeah. physics. Right. We can mold this together to get an accurate understanding of the nature of reality, who mm -hmm. we really are, yeah. what is our story? Mm -hmm. Because we truly have an epic story that needs yeah. to be told. Yeah. And once people understand who we really are and what we're a part of, it changes everything. Uh, one of the examples that I like to give is just imagine if people knew the truth of what we are from these ancient tablets. I mean, we just read that it states that Adapa was even greater than our creators. Yes. We became greater <laughs> than our creators. That story is echoed all throughout history. Yeah. So for us, Billy and I wanted to put a book together that didn't, didn't just touch on a couple aspects, but this is basically the chronicles of our story. Exactly. And so we're going to change this paradigm here. We're going to change the paradigm. We want to empower you. Now it's not just uh, that we're empowering you, but we're going to give you the information that should empower you and understand the true divine nature of your soul and how powerful and incredible we all truly are. And that we're not just some meagerly, uh, you know, lowly, lowly beings uh, that need to get, stay on our knees all the time, hoping and begging for things to change. That we have the ability and the power inside of us to help make those changes. Exactly. I mean, we live in a, in a vast cosmos, billions and trillions of, of Earth-like planets mm -hmm. and constellations and star systems. And our, the ancient people of the past created structures aligned to these different star systems. We're getting back to the stars, aren't we, Bill? That's right. We sure are. That's a lot of the secret really behind 33rd degrees that they've hidden from us because you have to travel 33 times the speed of sound to break Earth's gravity. A lot of it has to do with getting back into space and also elevation of consciousness along with the spine and having the Kundalini awakening. It all is synergetic and all goes together. There is no coincidence. That's right. So I'm incredibly excited about everything coming up in the future, Billy. I love having these discussions with you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot more information to come. Yeah. We're just scratching the surface. But I want, I just want everyone to know that I, it's, it's an honor to be here in Maine oh, with you, man, this having this beautiful. great discussion, my friend. This is amazing. I'm glad I made the trip. This, is, this trip was a blessing for me, man. I really appreciate it, Matt. Thank you so much. Truly, my friend. It's, yeah. it's, it's an honor. All right, guys. Look. Another episode of Forbidden Knowledge TV and Mastermind Discussion with Matt LaCroix. Listen to his podcast. Where, can, where else can I find you, Matt? Uh, thanks, Billy. You can find me on my, my website at The Stage of Time, and I have um, uh, my YouTube page is uh, Matthew LaCroix. Okay, beautiful. Check it out. Get his books, guys, on Amazon. Again, my book, Compendium of the Animal Tablets, bestseller on Amazon for 17 months in a row. And don't forget to go to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Get your free three-day subscription. All right. I appreciate you guys.